Daryl, what are you doing with all my Warhammer kits? Well, yeah, I'm chopping them up to be something way more badass. Makes sense. I mean, it only took dozens of artists, engineers, and sculptors hundreds of hours to make each one of those individual miniatures to look exactly the way it does. But you know how to do it better. Yeah, I knew you'd understand. Have you ever seen a new model and just thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I just wish it sucked like 20% less. I feel like I have that reaction fairly often. For example, Games Workshop recently sent me the new Chaos Knight Army set. <laughs> and the new models in here are called War Dogs, extreme engines of destruction meant to lay waste to entire battalions of men. And while there are some aspects of these things that I think are pretty cool, by and large, they kind of give this vibe to me like big derpy ostriches. So instead, I got the Engines of Annihilation from Creature Caster, which are roughly the same size, have the same 100 millimeter base, and they're also big evil robots. But these things have silly chicken legs. I guess I just have to make my own. It doesn't resemble a bird at all. The hardest part of a kit bash that isn't mostly just based off of a single model is figuring out where to start. The engine of Annihilation comes with a pretty awesome sculpted base. So instead of building the body of the beast first and going from there, I decided I wanted to start here at the base. One of the biggest issues I have with larger models is that the posing of the legs often feels way too static and unnatural. If I can make the legs of this knight feel more like they're actually moving over and through the terrain in a natural way, it should make every future design choice easier as we go. This initial step did take quite a bit of time and tested my patience, but posing each toe individually so it felt like it was gripping for purchase on the wreckage below got me thinking that I was moving in the right direction. I then went back through with green stuff to fill out sections of the base to make sure no areas of the feet felt like they were floating off of the base, and even to add a bit of tearing into this metal on the wreckage to imply his toesies are super strong. Now there's a couple of tools that really help when working with epoxy putty like green stuff. The first one is a cheap set of wax carver tools. You get all these different ones, kind of look like dentist tools, but I wouldn't necessarily put them in my mouth. These are great for pushing the putty around and getting it where you need it to be. And once you get the putty where you want it and want to smooth it out or carve out the details you're looking for, you're gonna wanna use something known as clay shapers. These things really were a game changer when I first got them. And I will put links down in the video description of all of my gear that I'm using in today's video should you want to start your own customizing or kit bashing on your own. I wanted the hips to be a bit more open instead of just two flat legs facing in the same direction. It feels a lot more dynamic and it gives the impression that this thing has a range of movement much more akin to an animal. And throughout this entire project, I take time to hold different bits I'd like to use next to what I've already finished to help me make decisions on placement and pose. Here, I need to make sure the legs are roughly the correct width apart so they can line up with the hip joints that I'm gonna have to make later. The actual War Dog kit has a little bit of a squat, silly body, and I want our War Dog to actually look closer to the Chaos Knights, the big brothers that really have this imposing figure. Luckily, the Engines of Annihilation kit has amazing bits, including an awesome torso that will work great for our own War Dog. I did want to keep the iconic upper armor shell and pauldrons of the GW kit though. So I had to hack off the creature caster kit up near the top so the fit was relatively flush. And then using a glob of green stuff to connect the two parts means that I can pose the angle just how I like and it is firmly adhered without green stuff underneath being visible. Since it's air drying, it's important that epoxy putty like green stuff is given a little bit of time to set up once you get the pose just where you want it. Don't worry, this doesn't mean you have to stop hobbying while that cures. It just means you turn your attention to something else, like building the weapon arm loadouts for our war dog. I had so many damn options here. Between the two kits, I think there were like 10 to 12 different arm weapons I could have chosen. In hindsight, I kind of wish I would have chosen one of the engine of annihilation gun arms. They are so much more wicked. But after it's all complete, I can always just hack off an arm and attach another weapon and no one will be the wiser. Unless you make a video about it and you tell everybody that's what you did. Edit this part out. 
All right, back to our torso and trying to find a way to attach it to our legs without making it look janky. I chop off the hip joints from the war dog kit so they still can attach to the legs, but we now have a bit of a gap. The gap isn't too egregious, but I need these parts to be really secure. The torso is solid resin, so I drill a few holes to attach paper clips as reinforcement. I like using paper clips for this because they still give enough bend that I can position them just the way I like prior to gluing them in place. And with that, the basic frame of our robot is complete. So to delay making the next big build decision, I decided to do some mindless busy work, attaching various armor plates so I can see how much bulk these sections have, as well as go back and green stuff the gaps in the hips and toes. The last major factor in the pose of this build that's going to determine whether it looks cool or looks stupid is going to be the positioning of the arms. The standard war dog arms have a few articulation points, which is really helpful for me to pose them just the way I like before I glue them into position. But they are so stinking short like little baby T-Rex arms, no one's going to be intimidated by this thing with those baby arms. Okay, that's a bad analogy. T-Rexes are pretty, pretty scary. I decide to add the biceps from the Engine of Annihilation kit to give our arms some added length. But before I pose and attach them, I realize I have an issue that I'm gonna need to deal with sooner rather than later. Where the head attaches on the Engines of Annihilation kit is right kind of in the middle of their torso, which in the standard kit looks pretty badass. But for the way I'm building this out, it's just gonna end up looking like Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I needed a way to bring that head up to sit under the overhang of the knight's armor. I bend and coil a paper clip with some needle nose pliers. So the head is coming out of that hidey hole via a coil of wires and viscera. And as always, this is Warhammer and there's no such thing as too many skulls. So I grab my trusty box of skulls and squish them into his Jeffrey the Giraffe neck until we have an appropriate mount. And then I go about sculpting and placing all the coils and tentacles around that neck. I use Green Stuff World tentacle rollers of different sizes and then let them sit for about 20 to 30 minutes before adhering them to the model. I found this gives the putty a bit of time to firm up so you don't mush away all the detail when you're trying to place them but it's still quite pliable and easy to work with. Pro tip, if you're anything like me, you always mix up way more green stuff than you need. So just keep one of these tentacle rollers nearby your painting desk and whenever you mix up too much green stuff, just coil some out, put it in funny shapes, and you'll have some for a future project. Today's video is brought to us by Creature Caster, our neighborhood friendly Canadian miniature makers that have been creating nightmare fuel for years. One of the main kits I'm using for today's build is an Engine of Annihilation, which is a beautifully detailed kit. Hold on, and take that back. There's actually enough in here to make two full models with a hundred millimeter round bases. Everything from the weapon loadouts, heads, all the armor plates and even the main chassis are interchangeable. So you could make your own custom war dog for way less work than I am doing today. I was actually able to sneak some secret information out of the things Creature Caster has coming up. Later this summer, they are expanding the bits in these kits even more. Two new melee arm options, two new gun arm options, new shoulder mounted missile pods, and a bunch of new heads all set up for magnets so you can change the setup whenever you want and those add-on kits are also going to be sold separately so you aren't losing out if you already own the models so head on over to the creature caster link in the video description below and check out these guys as well as their full range of amazing monsters both large and small Oh, and I almost forgot, their Judgment Eternal Champions campaign is ending soon, June 19th to be exact. This is your last chance to get the exclusive Isabel model, and she is gorgeous. A big thank you to Creature Caster for supporting the channel. Go check them out. 
I realized it was pretty nice to work on the head and neck without the arms attached and in the way, so I decided to get some more of the details done before I go back to the arms. The engines of Annihilation have these awesome, awesome loincloths that are obviously used to cover up those tender robot bits. And I used some cheap chain from a craft store to cover up some of the exposed green stuff. This chain is an example of cheap things you can use for your kit bashing that weren't intended for the hobby. Other great things include 0.65 millimeter rope from model ship kits. This stuff is the perfect width for our scale to be actual rope. There's all sorts of great little plastic things from the model train world like these little rivets. And of course, all sorts of weird little gears and little pieces of metal inside of things like old cheap watches, old wind up toys, and even lighters. All right, let's finally get these arms on. I made a pretty big boo-boo on this first arm. I forgot to use a paperclip armature to give it a nice stable hold, and only a small bit of the bicep was connected to any bit of the model. I filled it with some green stuff in the gap, but the whole arm was sagging while the green stuff was curing. I tried to prop it up with whatever I could find that was the right height, but that meant as I was working on any other part of the model and moving it, I needed to make sure that it didn't fall off of the supports, which it often did, and it came back to sagging again and again. I was happy with how the position of these arms turned out. Because I pulled them further away from the chest of the model, I could give them a more natural movement that would be fitting to a creature mid-stride. Remember that when we walk and the right leg is forward, the left arm mirrors that movement. So I went with that general feel to keep it from looking too rigid and unnatural. Just think of how Mario jumps. It's a me! At this point, it was best to let the green stuff supporting those arms cure overnight. And the next morning, I worked on positioning the articulating sections of those arms so I could get the most dynamic angles possible. This actually worked out really well. Because each of these arms had two separate articulation points, I didn't need to determine my final pose for each arm before attaching them to the body. Now onto the final stretch, where we bulk out the model with all sorts of details in an attempt to make it look like a real kit and not just a bunch of stuff glued together. The main area that I see that needs some attention is the upper armor plates on our war dog here. There's a good amount of awkward blank space and weird overhangs. So I used some bits that I already had to help fill this out with hanging chains, horns, and other random things like exhaust pipes. I was also immediately rewarded for making those extra coils and tentacles the day before as I saw some great places to have some hanging from the underneath of the armor panels up near the head. The final bit I knew I needed to use was this awesome thing from the Creature Caster Kit. And I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I think it looks badass. And I think it would look just perfect right at the top of the armor plate between the shoulders. But this part of the conversion was not gonna be easily handled with just a few scrapes of the hobby knife. That's why I needed to bust out my Dremel. There's a lot of amazing attachments for these things that work great in our hobby, but you need to be careful. One, they'll go through resin and plastic like it's butter. And two, make sure you're wearing a mask. The last thing you wanna be doing is sanding off a piece of resin or plastic and be breathing in all the particulates. I used some green stuff to make it flush and then added another shoulder gun because you can literally never have too many shoulder guns. And then added some irregularities of grit and grime and rust with a couple of texture pastes. This stuff is perfect for ensuring any less than perfect aspects of your build are covered with texture and decay. So you don't have to worry about being perfect on every section of your kit bash. Now I hear you saying, John, are you gonna paint this thing? Yes. I will commit to a dedicated painting video where I paint my war dog. However, I'm gonna need your help first. As is tradition, we first need to name our war dog. So put your name ideas in the comments below and I will choose whichever name is befitting and credit you in the painting video for naming her. And speaking of painting, what color scheme would you like to see our war dog painted in? There are all sorts of awesome ones in the Chaos Knights book. So if you'd like to see one of those, let me know which, or if there's a different color scheme, maybe a Chaos Space Marines color scheme, for instance, I'm open to those as well. I'll paint it up based on one of your choices in the comment section below, and I will give you full credit as well. Or you get all the blame if the paint job looks like ass. And the last thing I need your help on is please hit the like and subscribe buttons below. It really helps other people find the channel and you don't miss out on all the awesome videos that I have planned all summer long and beyond. 
And before we blow this popsicle stand, I want to take a moment to thank all of the members of the Ninja on Patreon. It's because of you why this video gets to be made and why I get to smash up like three, four hundred dollars worth of models to make one custom war dog. If you're not a member of the Ninja on Patreon and you want to join our clan, please check out the link in the video description below and see all the cool rewards you get for joining us there. see you back here again real soon and sometime between now and then make sure you find some time to slay the gray or chop it up glue it back together and make new gray that's also okay i think they need to make these models bigger so you can take these pieces off easier